been a hit. Too late. I'm scared. Greetings, wonder women and wonder men. Welcome to That Gets My Coat. Excelsior! I'm Stan Lee. When I created Wonder Woman, I was thinking of bosoms. All right, everybody, this is Big Anklevich. And this is Rich Outfield. And we're here to talk Wonder Woman. Do 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 Wonder Woman! Wonder Woman! Do, do, the whole do, world do, do, do. is waiting for you. Um, you had asked me before this movie came out if they would incorporate that song in some way. Uh, something tells me they made the right choice. Yeah, I don't know how they could have uh, incorporated it. It really wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have worked like the Spider-Man song did in the Spider-Man movies when they did that. They could have played it at the end credits. That wouldn't have hurt. Yeah, yeah, it would have. The people that were sitting through the credits would have had even more to complain about. <laughs> All right, so to start off with, do you give it a thumbs up or thumbs down, Ebert? Well, are we just reviewing it as a movie or is it some kind of statement? Is it some kind of symbol? Is it some kind of achievement beyond just cinema? Because I've been hearing a whole lot about that. And it almost becomes impossible to talk about the movie without talking about all that baggage. In the same way that when you and I saw Dark Knight Rises and some psycho shithead killed a bunch of people at the premiere, we felt like we had to talk about that. Uh huh. It tainted. Uh, okay, it tainted Dark Knight. I'm not going to say. Feminism and, and achievements and women and this being and finally and wow, what have we done? And you've come a long way, baby. Tainted Wonder Woman. But it certainly became part of the conversation. Is it okay if we just talk about the movie? That's what I'd like to do. I'm, uh, I guess that there's a bunch of other stuff and we can hit on that if you want. But I was mostly just planning on talking about the movie. Okay. As a movie. Well, then and what it, it is, and whether it was good, and how it was good, and how it wasn't good, and that kind of stuff was my plan. Okay, that, that sounds like a plan, Stan. I'm right here, always with you, true believers. Excelsior! Uh, I, I give it a thumbs up, actually. <laughs> yeah? Good. I, but, I, you know, I didn't have great expectations. I don't love no, Wonder Woman the way that you love Wonder Woman. This wasn't great expectations. This is a different Wonder movie. <laughs> You don't love Wonder Woman the way that I love? Love her as I loved her, and there will be peace in Gilda. Right. What you said just there, <laughs> I, I really have nothing more to add. No, I mean, you... I, I, you I have a fixation on Wonder... You have, I have an a... appreciation for Wonder Woman that I don't have. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't like the character. This isn't Ant-Man or... Doctor Strange or one of those characters that I knew existed, but I had no feelings for one way or another. I appreciate Wonder Woman, but I'm not a huge reader of DC Comics, and the few comics I've read that have Wonder Woman in them were always Batman-related or Justice League-related. Well, as far as comics go, you probably know more of Wonder Woman than I do, because I've, I've read probably a tenth... Uh, the comics that you've read, and most of them I've only read because you told me to read. There's a few that I think I may have read that you haven't, because I did have a friend that I worked with for a while who would just bring me trade paperbacks that he had. Here, read this one now. Here, read this one now. It was like the uh, that commercial for the munchies. Here, read this. Here, read that. Now, now you're, you're not, not just, just bored, bored, you're fat! fat. That's but what were, this guy was like. Were he any was, of those Wonder Woman comics? No, they weren't Wonder, Wonder Woman, Woman comics. They would be like Justice League comics okay. or uh, but you'd have Batman, Wonder Woman Superman, there. including Wonder Woman kind of okay. comics. Yes. I think I want to say they were Justice League ones. Like there was a series that he gave me that was called Identity Crisis. Okay. That's the only Justice League uh, comic that I've read. And, oh, okay. Uh, I did read several Superman, Batman. I read a series called Trinity that was about the, those three characters. But yeah, that's that's my Wonder Woman exposure. But yeah, see, my Wonder Woman thing 
probably comes from all the way back when I was younger and there was the uh, TV show. I watched, I saw a lot of that and I was in love with Linda Carter. Like seriously, she, at one time uh, back when I was much younger, sadly, I worked at the overnight stocking crew at a grocery store. And one time uh, all the guys were talking about, you know, oh, well, who was the most beautiful girl from when you were younger? And I think it came down to a few who said Farrah Fawcett from Charlie's Angels, which I'd never seen, so I couldn't couldn't really vote for Farrah Fawcett. And then somebody else said, oh, no, but I was thinking Linda Carter. And I went, oh, yes, you and got that my day vote. you became a man. Yeah, I still love Linda Carter. And I was excited just to see her name in the credits when they said filmmakers would like to thank Linda Carter and I said so would I I have a little thing for Wonder Woman I have to admit I can't help it I don't know what it is why it is but yeah I love Wonder Woman okay but yeah I, I that's what there's been though I mean there was the TV show and then what I guess she had an appearance in uh that Superman v. Batman movie, which I was saying before we went, I almost want... I mean, I I hated Man of Steel so much that I refused to see Superman v. Batman, but I almost want to see it just because I know Wonder Woman has a small part in it. You were suggesting that I should just search YouTube to find somebody who just made a video that's all Wonder Woman appearances because you assume that that has to exist and I tend to agree with you and maybe I'll just do that I haven't I was never a comics reader so I as far as I can say is yeah Wonder Woman was TV show and this movie and nothing in between except for the Lego movie she was in that first <laughs> cinematic appearance of Wonder Woman there was a Justice League animated series made by Bruce Timm and Paul Dini and and I saw a couple of episodes, including the Wonder Woman-centric episode, which I really enjoyed. But yeah, I had a friend who just absolutely loved DC Comics, and he would talk about Wonder Woman very knowledgeably and passionately. I mean, he he felt protective of the character. And uh, I, in fact, I think one of the few arguments that we ever had was Wonder Woman-centric. Uh, I heard his feelings because I criticized the character of Etta Candy and her catchphrase. Which is woohoo. But those days are gone, and so is he, so I never had a chance to apologize. But uh, you. Candy didn't say up woo-hoo or No, she did not. In this show, so that's kind of sad. I mean, maybe she did, and I missed it. Maybe uh, she said woohoo. Yes, exactly. Like that when she t- was handed the sword <laughs> or something. I don't know. I um, really liked the way they handled it at Candy. I, I, that, that was pretty good. You know, not a ton of comic relief. Not not a ton of room for comic relief in this movie, but she got to have quite a few. And then, yeah, Steve Trevor got to deadpan a lot, uh, which I enjoyed. But, you know, not every movie has to have comic relief. I, I, I Sorry, did you still not say whether it was... Uh, I, give it a, I give it a thumbs up. Okay. Roger. All right. So this was an ugly as hell movie. And and let me preface this by saying, I think it was intentional. I think they were trying to show us the horrors of war, the soot, for lack of an S word, that Ares had brought down upon the earth, and the contrast between Themyscira and and man's world, as they called it in the comics, you know, and the, the rest of the planet. But yeah, just lots of grays and browns and smoke and soot silt and s- snot. Well, not a lot of snot, but other S words. Soot? Did you say I soot? I said soot before. Did you say shit? No, I didn't. I was trying not to. Oh, oh, we were trying to... Can you bleep it? In, like, the editing? If you'd like me to, sure. Please, because I... Oh, I had no idea that I was just going to ruin our rating. Did you notice that as well? Just how gray and uh, just miserable the film was, except for the paradise island stuff yeah yeah it was that way and and in all fairness i think london in 1918 or 17 kind of was that way 
I mean, coal burning was the way they got energy in those days, pretty much exclusively, and so smoke was coming out of every stack, and there was a stack in every house, and the air has cleared up significantly since those days. Even this area where we live, you know, just in the space of like 50 years, things have, have changed significantly, and so that is one of those things where yeah, it was gray and grungy and yucky, but it's not totally stylistic. I think they were trying to be true to it as well. I Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that was necessarily a, a stylistic thing. I assume all the war stuff obviously was. Yeah, I don't know about the, um, you know, when she says, he says, Welcome to London, and she says, It's horrible. And he says, Yeah, it's not for everybody. <laughs> Where is Steve Trevor supposed to be from, do you know? He's supposed to be an American, I would assume. He's American, he speaks... but if you recall, in the DC universe, there are fictional cities. Oh, right. Like Metropolis and Gotham and Central City and Coast City and Star City. And Starling City? Mm, Starling City is actually <laughs> Star City, but, you know, I, I have no idea. Whatever city the Wonder Woman comics take place in is my guess where he's from. Oh, okay. But he's not, like, from... Montana or something like from a ranch and so he grew up in the big sky country where it's not all cloudy and covered in smoke or something I, that, that's not, fair I, I, I don't know anything about Steve Trevor okay. you watched the original series the 70s series when the first season took place during World War II and the second season took place in the 70s but I believe Steve Trevor was in both <laughs> <laughs> and so maybe you would know better where he was supposed to be. Filmed. I watched that series when it was at least in its first bit of reruns, if not when it was new. So I don't remember anything about it other than that. Oh, okay. Linda Carter was in it, and she turned into Wonder Woman by spinning in a circle, and then they would make a noise and a flash of light, and then she would be Wonder Woman. Indeed she did. That's, that's really as much as I can remember. Sorry. Okay, uh, that's, that's fine. Um, in, then let's cut out all of this, and I can simply say, I don't know, Big. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> the Paradise Island thing. I thought that it was interesting. I I'd, uh, avoided watching anything or reading anything about this movie. In the back of my mind, I thought I wouldn't go see it unless the the reviews were really, really good. But you said, you know, I have one final wish That's right. before I go. Before I die, and we then, must go and see the Wonder Woman movie. Yes, you said I want a cake to be made for me that I can't eat, and I'd like to go see Wonder Woman. And so those two things came true today. And, and, and yeah, I was willing to go see it with you. I just, because it's part of the DC extended universe is that what they call their cinematic universe? I, I was don't hesitant know. to go see it, right? But we, you and I, saw Suicide Squad, and I didn't regret seeing that, even though you know a lot of people don't like that movie. You know, the the jury is still out on Justice League whether I'll go see that or not. Too, I, I just i I don't like the aesthetic of those movies, and I certainly don't like their treatment of Superman. So I just didn't feel compelled to see this movie. But I would suggest that it, none of that matters, that none of that influenced this movie, except for, you know, the casting of Gal Gadot, right? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, you get a tiny little kind of uh, frame, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, on either end of the movie, you have a present-day uh, Wonder Woman. She gets a little picture from the past story and then right at the very end you see her again looking at the picture and saying yep that's the picture that's all you have as far as the greater dc universe is concerned so yeah it has really very nothing to do with it except for the gal Gadot's in it who i thought was great i'm sure it's kind of difficult to be wonder woman uh you gotta have physical stature you can't be I don't know, Kristen Chenoweth or something and be Wonder Woman because <laughs> it's just not going to work when you don't fit the bill of an Amazon. You know, an Amazon has a certain kind of a uh, 
connotation to it. And so, you know, Wonder Woman's got to be pretty imposing a figure. And I thought she was just well cast for it. She was per I loved it. And I loved the accent, too. I don't know if that's just her regular old accent. That is. And, and that was something that I noticed in the trailers and appreciated was that the other Themyserans, and I don't know if I'm saying that word right, they say it, they said it in the movie they gave it differently a C. than Themyscira, I say it. Themyscira, say. okay, that's how they said it. I, I've just said it, said it the other way for so long. But I noticed that the other Themyscirans sort of adopted Gal Gadot's accent mm -hmm. for the Amazons, and I thought that was just brilliant. Just And the little girl who movie. did that, I was pretty, pretty impressed with, you know, the young Diana would talk that way. I can't, I mean, I just, I, sometimes I make movies with my kids for fun, and I just worked on one like a couple weeks ago trying to finish this one up from years and years ago that I'd, I'd done, and just getting my son to say the lines was a monumental task. I don't know how kids, any kid learns to act. It just blows me away. And then a kid acting and doing an accent. Unless they got a kid that had an accent. I guess that's always possible. Maybe that's the way the kid really talks. I, I got the impression I, that I didn't it was think a, so. an affected accent. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I was pretty impressed by that. But I liked the accent. I liked... She looked great. I even liked, you know, normally we complain about the way they have to change up the costume of a superhero to make it palatable for a movie audience so people don't go oh come on like anybody would go out in a blue and red suit with webs all over it uh but in this case yeah they, they pretty much just went for it it was uh, i guess a little darker red and blue than is traditional but i don't i didn't find that to be an issue i just yeah i just thought it looked great that was one of the things that I was saying, you know, we were talking about expectations and what kind of expectations we had for it beforehand. I didn't have high expectations. I hoped it was good. I'd heard it was good. And I was afraid to hear that it was good too much because I didn't want to get high expectations. But, you know, as I said, there was just Gal Gadot running around in that outfit in the movie is real, was really enough to make me happy. Um... <laughs> And then anything above that is is just, you know, gravy. It's just going to all the better. But yeah, it was it was really well. I thought there was a few times in there where they were a little heavy-handed with things. And and there were some things too that didn't make a lot of sense. Like at the start when they're arriving on the western front and there's all these people fleeing the western front. And oh, their horses are stuck in the water and why are they whipping them why did they treat their animals that way oh they gotta get out in a hurry and it's like, this is 1918 on the western front it's been four years that they've been dug into these trenches and they've been shelling back and forth and going over the top in waves and being cut down like grass and over and over and over and over. Why are there still people fleeing the Western Front? What have they been doing for the last four years? I guess that would be a historical inaccuracy for story's sake. To make. Oh yeah, see how bad war is for the people who get caught in the crossfire? But yeah, they go into the trench and there's a woman with a baby in the trench. What the f***? What is she doing there? But yeah, again, that was, I think, just so that they could say, hey, over on the other side, there's a village that's not having a good time. We got to go save them. Let's go. I guess that happens plenty. So the question I, I'd like to ask is, why World War One? You know, they, they chose the... The unsexy war, <laughs> if you will, and pardon my French for that, but everyone knows that World War II is the sexy one, and the one that even school children today have heard of. And it's and the one Wonder that... Woman was created for World War II. I just, I, 
I, it's not a complaint so much as a just a. I wonder why. Do you? Is it to take a step away from Captain America? Is that what they were thinking? I would think so. I would think they don't want it to just be oh, this is Captain America, uh, but Captain S America. I don't know, because yeah, Captain America just did that a few years ago, and he's a big character for Marvel. He's a big deal, and he's kind of associated with that in people's mind. And so I think if you put it in World War II, then it would just put that in everyone's mind. Oh, this is just rip off of Captain America, which you don't want to do, I guess. I don't know. Okay. But, but you do need a big worldwide conflict, and they did call it the War to End All Wars. They did. But I really think they should have gone with the Napoleonic Wars. Okay. <laughs> the thing that I wonder is, you know, say why why World War One instead of World War Two? Because also people tend to know what was going on. Like people know the story of World War Two. Yes. World War One, nobody knows like why it happened, what was going on, you know, what was to be gained and lost. It was just a, a bunch of monarchies got together and had another war, except for now they've got weapons of a much higher level of destruction than they have in the past. And so, you know, it's not some cannons and horses. Instead, it's gas masks and chemical weapons and etc. People know about Sarajevo. That's where it started. Because one Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated and then it cascaded from there. But that's... That, and they know about the Western Front. And that's pretty much like all most people know about World War One. So it is weird that they would choose that. I read these uh, Scott Westerfeld books. I don't know if they had a name for the trilogy, but the Leviathan was the first book, and then the next one was like Behemoth, and then Goliath, I think, was the last one. They were set in World War One. In that case, I thought that was a great idea, because... Although it was a fantasy World War One, you got basically you you kind of learned what the story what happened in World War One by way of reading those. You know, oh, this happened here, and this. Of course, they changed things up to fit the fantasy world, but uh, unfortunately, with the movie, you don't really have time to do that kind of stuff. So you know, it's cool that it was World War One because that's something new, but you don't really get to learn anything about what happened there. Instead, they're throwing villagers in the middle of the trenches four years after they dug them. As though they're like, oh, now we need to go because it's suddenly gotten bad. I don't know. Why do you think they went with World War One? You think it was just the Captain America thing? I think that was the major f reason. But also, it's more exotic in, uh -huh. in a way. Far fewer movies are made of World War One. Nobody is around anymore right. that lived through World War I. Yeah. So, so it stands apart more than the, uh, you know, I mean, it's been you can probably name three or four superhero movies that took place in World War II. But it's, it, it would be difficult to name three or four movies that took place in World War I. Yeah, it's been a century since the United States entered World War I. And World War II is just so colorful and widespread and documented with vibrant personalities that people remember today and so many different focuses and, and cinematic stories to be told that maybe it's just done to death. And yeah, there somebody is somewhere decided, you know what, World War I is where it's at. Because kids don't know anything about World War One, it's going to look different than any other period film, and uh, there there are, there are a couple of advantages to that. With you know the technology, the kind of airplanes, and the that scene where she crosses no man's land was I found to be quite cinematic, quite enjoyable, and you could have concocted a scenario like that. For World War II, but it's not the iconic what everybody thinks about for World War One. But anyhow, yeah, I, I'm glad that they 
made a period film. I just I like the period films. In fact, five or six years ago when we saw the first Captain America movie, I was bummed that it ended with him in modern day. I was hoping they would make three or four World War II centric Captain America movies before moving on. Just because it it's unique. It's it's I don't know. There's something special. Something quaint about it. The Incredibles, I don't know where that's supposed to take place, but it felt like the past, and that makes it unique. You know, the Rocketeer, just the time period makes those those kind of things special. And that's also the origin of comic books in general, you know, like if I were to make a Fantastic Four movie, I think that's what I would want to do, is set it in the 60s back when they were actually originally created. I know that that might not work with the whole general Marvel Universe thing. But Fantastic Four aren't part of it, so there's that. (laughs) And yeah, the other thing is I I felt like it was brave to have a period superhero movie, a a, period Wonder Woman movie. Because your kids won't watch anything that was made before 2006. Was it six? And uh, yeah, that's the that's the the arbitrary cutoff. Yeah, here. that's what they wrote down when I said, "How far back will you guys watch?" Because I was trying to get them to watch a black and white movie, and they said, "No, nothing before." And they all got together and kind of discussed it for a minute, and handed me a piece of slip of paper, two thousand six. <laughs> Horrible! And your five year old was the one that wrote it down. Yeah, he's uh, learned his letters. He was in preschool this year, so he's good. <sighs> But again, uh, I appreciated the periodness of it because it felt different. And there was a certain amount of commentary on what man has done and what man considers women capable of and all that stuff that goes down easier if it's a period film. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's too clo- it hits too close to home if you set it in 2017 and, you know, there's going to be people that are more offended or more, they, that are more willing to get upset. But when you said it a century ago, when women could not vote, you're just like, oh, yeah, you know what? Times were unfair. And so, I, you know, I like that, too. But, uh, yeah, the, as far as an origin story for Wonder Woman, I felt like they hit every point that was important um, in the the comics that I've read or, you know, the origin stories that there was only one other element that they left out, which was that Themyscira, they said, Uh it's going to be hard for me to start saying it. It's like when Coruscant suddenly dropped the sea, you know, but there's a sea in there. It's Coruscant. (laughs) The hell? But with Themyscira, they had a contest of, who would be the representative? Who would be the emissary to man's world? Where they all competed, you know, and Diana came out on top. But this did away with all of that, and, and I can see why. It's it's fine. They, they, they tried to get a lot of stuff done. You know, there was the war stuff, and they tried to give Steve Trevor a lot of stuff to do and develop his character and develop the romance and her opening of her eyes of what... And I keep calling it Man's World. They never called it Man's World in the movie. So let me just not say that anymore. Uh, opening her eyes to what the world was all about. And uh, there was a level of naivete that they gave her. Not nearly uh, so much as I would have done. Yeah. Because I love that stuff. I love the fish out of water stuff. You know, the, yeah. the Steve Rogers doesn't get your jokes. Steve Rogers has never sent a text message kind of stuff. I love that. Yeah, that's one of those things that I enjoyed when they did happen. I wished also that they would have happened more. I guess they only had so much time right. to do that kind of stuff. But yeah, when she stopped, oh, a baby, you know, <laughs> the, just the things. The ice cream thing yeah. was very, very, those, I don't those know, it humanized fun. her a little bit. And I like that. And I guess the question I need to ask myself is, does she need to be humanized? She's not a human being. When I was talking to my friend about this movie, I said, well, who is the audience going to relate to? Who is the audience going to sympathize with, empathize with? I mean, it's not going to be the god, right? It's going to be the the man that 
is seeing her for the first time. We're seeing through his eyes and all that. And my friend said, absolutely, you're wrong. So many women and girls are going to go to this movie and say, that's me right there. That chick with the bracelets and, and who can jump 15 stories and, you know, <laughs> has the magic lasso. That is me. And when he said that, I really surprised me. I, I just had not so considered that. It didn't occur to me uh, that there would be people yeah, just... like that. But yeah, everybody's different. I just, yeah, I don't go into a Superman movie feeling like I am Superman. But yeah, I don't know. I think w with Superman, you do empathize with or, or see or put yourself in his place, but more as the Clark Kent half of Superman than you do the Superman half. Uh, I don't know. I think, I don't know how, how that works with Wonder Woman. If, if people do see themselves in her place and, oh yeah, just like her, I want to prove myself. You know, there was that. Her mom didn't want her to train, didn't want her to be like the other Amazonians. Themyscirians. Amazons. Amazons. You know, she wanted her to be able to be innocent and to not become the god killer. You know, Wonder Woman is, is you know, we, we mentioned we're not going to talk much about this, but she's kind of that feminist icon of, you know, a woman can be great and can be what she wants to be and doesn't have to be what other people want her to be. Uh, and Wonder Woman was basically that, you know. she was. They wanted her to be something else. But she knew in her heart that she was something different and wanted to be that and uh, worked to become the greatest. You know, it doesn't even have to be a feminist icon. I mean, that's just a human uh, thing. Everybody wants to be the best that they can be. And, and, you know, some people want you to just fulfill whatever role that they think you should. But, you know, you got to follow your own heart and your own dreams and, and, and achieve those kind of things. Yeah, and that's what a lot of us want to do in life. A lot of us feel like there's more out there for us. And that's one of the reasons why I'm still trying to write. You know, I feel like that's something that I'm good at. I feel like it's something that I'm called to do. And, you know, I could follow Wonder Woman's example and be a Wonder Man, although Wonder Man is somebody else. It's a Marvel character. That is something that I really responded to in the movie. When she did these amazing things, that didn't do so much for me because I've, I've seen it all. I've seen a million movies, guys. But when people around her saw her do these things, and the village, when she saved the village and they all thanked her and gathered around her and she saw the difference that she made in these people's lives that moved me that touched me the i, I guess not her so much but but the uh, the how people saw her you know what i'm seeing when when there were people and we didn't really hear what they were saying but they were praising her or thanking her or congratulating her and, and i just i i really enjoyed that a bit about it and I, I would imagine that that was the goal that they were trying to set up. That you know, it's like yes, she was a god, but she cared about those around her. She cared about human beings. She didn't see herself as above the people around her. Uh, she saw where she could make a difference, and she felt that it was her duty to make that difference. And and I think that that's something that Steve Trevor had in common with her. I really liked that. I, I thought that, you know, I, I should have expected they were going to kill off Steve Trevor, but it didn't occur to me until a minute and a half before it happened that they were going to, just because we've been trained <laughs> to expect happy endings <laughs> in these big blockbuster movies. But yeah, he saw a difference that he could make, and it was going to cost him his life, and he was willing to to pay that price. and. You know, that's admirable, too. I, I admired him. I looked up to him as well. Yeah, that was uh, interesting. You know, and it's one of the things that they're, they're always trying to do with the uh, female characters in all the various films. You know, you have Spider-Man's girlfriend, and she's always in there fighting the bad guy just as much. And then, yeah, and, and this is probably our first... I can't think of another movie where we had a 
basically a male damsel to be rescued. And, and, you know, they went the same track. You know, he wasn't a damsel any more than Mary Jane or Gwen Stacy, uh, you know, was in, in those films. You know, they they were fighting and doing their thing. And, and Steve, you know, found a way. I mean, obviously he was vastly underpowered to be fighting alongside Wonder Woman, but he even found a way to, you know, do the, the shield thing to boost her up so that she could take out the sniper in the tower. In the end, he was able to make the great sacrifice, and by making that great sacrifice, helped Diana to understand that people really are worth something. And she was able to achieve her full potential. What did you think of the end battle of her against Ares? Well, t- two things. One, and and this goes for all movies, guys. It just was too big, too many special effects and all that stuff. I needed it to be just a little bit toned down so it was just people for me to care. But then, yeah, two, I had seen it before. I mean, some of the stuff that guy, Ares was saying, I was just like, wow, this is getting close to word for word, kids. I, um, I, it felt like one of the weaker aspects of the movie to me. Where suddenly it became two gods fighting, which I, I thought that that's fine. I mean, they were and all that, but it just visually it just became too much. And we were seeing stuff that we hadn't seen through the rest of the movie. And then that dang mustache <laughs> looked ridiculous. And I mean, they showed Ares flashback to when Zeus banished him and he had the mustache then. And I was just like, wow you guys are really standing behind this mustache <laughs> commitment. I feel like yeah. you're back in the wrong horse on this. I expected Ares to, when he put on his power, you know, he gathered up his armor and all that kind of stuff and became Ares. That at this point, you're not going to have our same old actor underneath with the mustache and with the whole bit you might hear his voice which for a while that's kind of all you got was you heard his voice coming out of this armor but then eventually they knocked the helmet off and he's still just the same guy in there just some old guy the mustache it wasn't awesome but yeah i'd I'd have to agree i the final action scene it stopped being realistic i guess uh it was just aries was like making swords with telepathy and throwing things at Diana and she'd just get fling flang here and there. She'd just get flung all over the place and put a divot in the asphalt every time she came down. But I don't think we had seen that level of power from Diana before. She's not human, but we saw she was much closer to human through the rest of it. And right. Yeah, to get knocked into a tank or whatever and ha- leave a bodily impression of yourself into the tank and then just step away from that, it was like we had missed a scene where her powers had been unlocked. Right. And now she was at a 10, whereas she had been a 3 before. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's weird. Like End of Guardians, like Man of Steel or whatever, when you see the gods fighting... And there's no damage that they can do to one another. I sort of mentally and emotionally check out. Uh huh. Yeah, there was that bit. Like the whole time, I kept waiting. I knew because I'd seen in like trailers and stuff like that of people just shooting like machine guns at her. I'd seen some of that stuff from her crossing the no man's land where she's taking on the machine guns. But before that, we see Germans invade the beach at Themyscira, and. Amazon's killed just by a bullet. They take a bullet, they die. Their greatest warrior ever, who I don't... I I could never get the name of. They called her General sometimes. And it was the Queen's sister, Hippolyta's sister. And I think she was played by Robin Wright. She was. But anyway, she takes a bullet, and, and that finishes her off. So, therefore, I'm thinking, okay, if Diana takes a bullet, then she's dead. Or she's taking a bullet just like a human would but they do i guess say oh yeah she doesn't know who she is or what she's not she an is Amazon. They she can't was. be told what she is apparently she is more and they did have a, a scene where she'd gotten cut 
on the arm, mm -hmm. and then they pulled the bandage off, and it was totally healed. They didn't really uh, make any fuss or or point that out. Hey, you heal really fast. That's neat, or anything like that. I don't know. If well, that for works. fear of tipping their hand, I think too early as to what the story was. But you know, that revelation didn't pack the same wallop that I expected it to. Now, see, I fully expected Ares was her father. I didn't realize Zeus was her father. I guess that makes it a little different, especially when she calls him brother right before she kills him. But when she killed Danny Houston's character, and I'm sorry, maybe you remember his name. The but general I, guy? Yeah, uh-huh. I, I, I could have told you his name earlier, but I've, it's fled. Well, I thought, maybe we aren't going to get closure on Ares here. Maybe Ares is who the Justice League fight. That's what I was thinking. Huh, okay. Well, that that's interesting. I wonder if that is going to be disappointing. And then Ares shows up, and it's like, oh, okay, well, I guess we will get that closure on this. Yeah, I considered that, too. It's just like, Ares is her joker or whatever. He has to always be around. She can't kill him, because if she does, then how does World War II happen? Or et cetera, <laughs> you know? I mean, this is... This really wasn't the war to end all wars, despite the fact that they called it that. But instead, we did have the, the fight with Ares. And yeah, when it got to that point, it was this gods fighting gods. And I, I did definitely, uh, it lost interest. Okay, so you emotionally checked as out well. as well. More so, I think, than I did with Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, well, it just... They also... And, and I see, I, I should have done a little bit of research, but... I didn't want to encounter spoilers, but I should have found out how much of a budget this movie had because, for the most part, there were no bad special effects. I mean, I, I was just like, wow, this is really, really well done. But then when we got to the gods fighting gods scenes, then it started to be a little bit more cartoony and I couldn't follow the action quite as much. And You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, that's, that's maybe something... That is just a fault of 21st century filmmaking. And you know, why do a, a stunt when you can have a, a digital double and it's just going to pass me by as more and more movies do that. But uh, I felt like the movie was very well directed. But then, yeah, we got to the big special effects extravaganza and it became less so. I was interested in what Steve and his... Mary Band were doing. I, I wonder Steve if they're... the Howling Commandos. Yeah, the Howling Commandos. <laughs> uh, I mean, that was very similar too, wasn't it? To the Howling Commandos. The script I thought was really good, and they had a lot of plates to to juggle. But if yeah, if they had decided to maybe reveal that Ares was still out there or whatever, and and then we didn't get our our huge fight. I mean, because at one point Diana she gives her speech of, you know, what Steve taught her. And then she becomes all powerful. And I guess he could have headed for the hills then and thought, wow, I, I'm no, no match for her right now and left that for another time. But I don't know. Maybe at that point, once she's powered up, she has won and it would be disappointing. It wouldn't be cathartic to see him get away. You, you, you want to see or take him down. Uh, and as soon as he was dead, I guess the uh, the fighting did end. And you saw these Germans take off their helmets and they were, or their uh, masks. gas masks, and they were kids. Uh -huh. And they did not focus on that a tremendous amount. I felt like they could have they could have put a hat on that if they had wanted to and pointed it out. But instead, it was a little bit subtle, and, and I don't know if it was intentionally subtle. But yeah, then there's the uh, the celebrating in London for Armistice Day. And for some reason, that spoke to me, too. That moved me. Because I know that that really happened. Uh-huh. And we live in a time when wars never end. They're never declared, and they never end. Yeah, instead and, we have a war on the concept. And that is so different than the crowds at Times Square on... VJ Day, or you know Armistice Day, or VA Day, V Day, and that kind of stuff where you see those images and you just you 
I don't know, for some reason, I'm always moved by that. What that would have been like, that, you know, this great national nightmare is over. And not national, but global nightmare is over. That kind of relief and that kind of joy that life is going to continue the way it was meant to continue. So there's another reason to set it in the past, I guess. I Yeah, I, I, I thought it was a fine film. Yeah, it sort of lost me at that one scene. And then we got the coda set in the 21st century again. And I just, that didn't work for me either. I don't know. There was a, an explosion and then she swung into action. Yeah. And, and just, that I thought was the worst shot of the whole and film I just was the we, last one of her jumping toward the camera <laughs> with like Paris in the background. Was it Paris? Oh my God. Yeah, she was at the Louvre. You're right. She was. I Sorry, I forgot. But yeah, it's just like, so she's the defender of that city, I suppose. That, I mean, that's what they, it was basically, you know, the bat signal has been turned on. And so it's time for him to go out once again. And da, 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 da. And then the credits roll. You're just like, yeah, he's out there again. But it didn't work. Yeah, it just wasn't awesome for some reason. The present day story part was completely unnecessary. And I think the only reason it was there was just because there's a Justice League movie coming up in, what, the fall, right? Six months from now, be ready for Wonder Woman to do stuff with Batman, who sent her the picture. I wouldn't be surprised if they, like, just shot that, like, last week and edited it in real quick. Or it's some crap. I don't know. It's just... It was not a part of the movie, but they put it in there just so that they could connect it to the present day stuff that's going on. But one thing is they didn't explain what Diana had been doing for a hundred years. Yeah. If, and I believe that photograph with the Howling Commandos and Diana was in Batman v Superman. Bruce Wayne digs it out of the archives or something like that. And he's like, oh, that leads me to believe that Wonder Woman has not been active for a, a century. You know what I mean? Because there would be more than just a hundred-year-old picture of Wonder Woman if she had been kicking butt all yeah, across the earth. Yeah, she should be well-known, completely famous. Even if it's an urban legend like some of those Batman movies had Batman be, where it's just like, ah, oh, you know, the bat? You think the bat got him? Ah, come on, that's a myth. That sort of stuff. But anyhow, I just, I, I don't know what the story is on that, but maybe... There are more Wonder Woman solo Wonder Woman stories to tell, or do you think that do you get the impression this was a single one-off film? Probably a one-off. I mean, they've released their list of all the things that they're doing right, and they don't have it on a Wonder Woman two on there. That's true. Not that they can't change that because you know they they did that with the Marvel schedule where they didn't have an Ant Man two, but then oh we're gonna squeeze it in here. Oh, we're going to put in Spider-Man. Oh, we're going to add uh, this other one. They work them in if things work out, I guess. I mean, I would guess the budget for this was similar to other movies like this, somewhere in the 200 million range. Although it, uh, it wasn't as special effects heavy as other ones have been. I don't know. Maybe well, maybe it does require special... Like all the... I jump off my horse and do a flip and turn sideways and shoot some arrows all at once. Maybe those shots require a lot of special effects. I don't know how that works. That did kind but of bug me a, a little bit here and there. But it's a shame they don't just hire acrobats to do that. <laughs> because except for Robin Wright, it's okay if these are women we don't know. Right. You know? Yeah. Well, I have to say, I did get a little irritated. Like, the time when she's running into the town and, like, busting through the walls and getting all the soldiers inside the thing and every time she would like she'd run 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 zero motion back to full speed punch 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 but see that was Zack Snyder's influence was it not uh, I, mean, I don't was know was that not but... the thing he did to death in 300 well to me that's old hat I don't want to ever see that again I know that's I but... I I'm irritated with it. I'm tired but of we've, it. But uh, we've, you know, I guess when it was first done, and you can cite the Matrix if you want to, it had been done before then, but okay. 
it was just like, wow, neat. But it just, yeah, it for some reason made it less realistic to me. It was just less palpable because in real life that doesn't happen. You don't get to stop in mid-action and then and the wink. action continues going and then it stops and, and all that slow motion. I can see that happening because, I, you know, I've been in a car accident and slow motion is real. <laughs> it was I was just like, oh, no, I'm going to crash into that car. Oh, no, I'm still going and I'm going to crash into that car. Oh, no, not stopping. What is that sound? That's my breath. Oh, no. And, you know, that kind of thing. It took like 20 seconds for those two seconds to go by. But no, that, that stylistic stuff didn't really help, I didn't think. And, yeah, maybe it did cost a lot of money, in which case that was wasted money. Just good fight choreography. You can't beat that, man. Yeah, I'm not a fan of that stuff. But for the most part, the fights I thought were very well done. I was able to suspend my disbelief almost from the very beginning. You know, sometimes you'll see these... What is the pejorative term they use for Mila Jovovich beating up a 400-pound man? Is it waifu? Waifu, thank you. I knew that. I just wanted to pretend I didn't. <laughs> the waifu thing where you see that, uh, a lot of times you're just like, oh, come on, man. That guy's fist is the size of her head. And she's fine? And all that. But in this, yeah, it never bothered me. I was just like, oh, yeah, of course she can. Well, she's Wonder Woman. She's Wonder Woman. Yeah, there you go. It's different. It's not Mila Jovovich. And Mila Jovovich is just supposed to be a person in all the movies that she's in. She's not supposed to be a god. She's not supposed to be basically like a match for Superman. It's something else. And on top of that, you know, she looked it. She was big and she was good with all the stuff that she was doing. She didn't ever look like she didn't know what she was doing out there. And I've heard, you know, that She's Israeli, and apparently Israelis have to spend two years in the oh, army. It's like a mandatory service. And so she did that, and I think after that, the guy at work was telling me that she worked still with the military for several more years training people how to fight and stuff like that. And I think also, you know, if you're in the Israeli military, then you have to learn Krav Maga and how to kick people in the crotch a lot. So she was, uh, I guess, had a leg up to begin with. But yeah, I mean, she pulled all that stuff off and really was Wonder Woman. So I, I have you know, nothing to complain about as far as that goes. She was an excellent choice for this role. And I, I remember at that Comic-Con where she came out, she gave a little speech about being Miss Israel in the Miss Universe pageant and representing her country and feeling that this was an extension of that. And that there was a, an entire globe full of girls that l adored this character. And it was her responsibility to live up to that and to, you know, be the best Wonder Woman that she was. And I was just like, dang, they found the right person for this job. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I remember being stick thin in those days when they first announced. Yeah, I remember you was, saying they need to give her like a bunch of food. But like her <laughs> arms looked really healthy. Yeah. Like pinnacle human physical condition. Fitness. Is what I was thinking. I was just like, yeah, and, and yeah, she always looked awesome. The way they'd light her and her hair yeah. was always kind of in motion, flowing and stuff like that. It And her facial expressions were just great. And just how much happiness the abilities that she had would bring her. You know, at the start when she would try something and then she would just be like, oh, I can do that. <laughs> and then, you know, she like jumped to climb that tower and she jumped and crabbed that thing. And then before she even grabs with the other hand, she smiles and says, ha, I did it. And again and again and again, she would do that throughout the movie. And I really liked that about her as well. It was just, yeah, the smile that she always kind of had, took with uh, everything that she was doing was good. Because, as you said, a lot of the rest of the stuff was pretty dour, you know. It was a gray world with lots of death and war and, you know, there's soldiers everywhere and pompous old awful English generals that, you know, just want to send more soldiers over the top. Maybe this time it'll work. So, you know, it was nice to have that as a uh, counterpoint 
Yeah, you'll have to tell me how it works, how the group dynamic works in Justice League. Because Batman's always going to be dour and unpleasant. I mean, that's part of his personality, and in fact, it's part of his charm. I don't know what Aquaman is, and they, we have already seen that this is not Boy Scout, cheerful Superman. Maybe she's going to be the, the smiling one in that group. I, I, I don't know. They got their work cut out for them. Only Joss Whedon could save them. <laughs> we'll see if that works out. All right, I think we've come to the end of this show. What do you think? I I agree. Yeah, we have. I I guess we focused a little bit on the negative. I hope that doesn't mean... I hope that doesn't sound like we didn't like the movie. I don't think we only focused on the negative. I think we had plenty of good things to say about it as well. So, Um, And we gave it two thumbs up. Yeah. Siskel and Ebert gave it a thumb up. So, that's good. Apparently that's the new Netflix rating thing. It's just a thumbs up instead of stars, which I agree with gives that you a, farting sound. It gives you a lot less info. <laughs> just change the stars to thumbs, then then it's fine. Agreed. Yeah, just the thumbs up and thumbs down is too arbitrary cuz you know, a movie like Suicide Squad, which has a lot of problems, but what didn't suck. If you only have thumbs up or thumbs down, I <laughs> Yeah, that doesn't tell you much of anything. Uh, but I, I, yes, I did give this movie thumbs up. If they make a second Wonder Woman, I would be happy to support that. I hope they do. I'd like to see more of Gal Gadot without the rest of them. <laughs> All right, thanks for listening, everybody. I've been Big Anklevich. I've been Rich Outfield. Stay wonderful. Gosh, I gotta come up with something better than that. (laughs) Wonder on. (laughs) That Gets My Go is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. This show is lame. As lame as Rich Outfield? No, not that lame. Okay, hold on one sec while this, uh, sounds like a diesel truck. Is it not? You are. That's louder and clackier than normal engine. Those sound like diesel, but I don't think they make those anymore. It is a giant truck. Ah. Unnecessarily giant? Yes. The person who drives it must be here doing work on the farm. We went to uh, out to eat the other night, and there was a, a woman that had just the most bizarre laugh. Can you imitate that laugh? No. Can you try? It was impossible to imitate. I said that that night. I said that's some that's a sound that I could never make. It was weird because it was it was so rapid fire. It was like a machine gun of laughter, and it was high pitched. It was like a. I can see. I can't. I, yeah, I, I don't think I could do I it. Can't it. Do I can't do it at all. <laughs> no, it's that's more of you know <laughs> like Jack Skellington a, yeah, on his scary, wedding night. Scary cackle um, there. But, but yeah, it's just it was it was it was upsetting. I, I I felt bad for me because I always do, but I also felt bad for the people sitting with her because every time that noise was made all heads turned because it was not a quiet noise it was a drawing attention to itself uh, and I'm just vamping right now until this f***ing car goes away he's doing a good job too I said fudging by the way well, that's good, you should bleep that though okay <laughs>